Hello and welcome to another episode of uh, the Mikey Campling podcast about writing and um, being an indie author and self-publishing and that sort of thing. I'm going to share my thoughts with you today, such as they are, um, on one of my uh, most popular blog posts, the one that people seem to keep finding me for. So I guess people are searching for this. And I titled my uh, blog post, Is Wool by Hugh Howey a Good Book for Young Adults or Teenagers? Um, Now there's some controversy around this, so I'm just going to put my two hapeth in. Um, There is a label, I believe, on some paperback editions of Wool that says something about it being um, kind of the next Hunger Games, which is kind of insulting to Hugh Howey, if you ask me. Um, I don't think it's a derivative work in that sense at all. And it kind of suggests it. I don't think Hugh will have put that on. I am pretty certain from the things that he said that that will be something from uh, the marketing people. You can make of that what you will. Um, and I think it has something to do with the whole phenomenon of YA, uh, young adults um, literature, and this whole business of labelling things. Now, I don't know about you, I'm really uncomfortable with this. I think it is mistaken. I think it is a marketing thing. And it, it is it is possibly um, actually slightly damaging, I think. Um, when I was a teenager, we didn't have YA books. And so I read things that we called in those days books. I read books that I chose because I liked them. I got into things like P.G. Woodhouse when I was quite young and... Um, if you have any kind of sense of humour at all, I think a lot of teenagers would actually quite enjoy that slightly ribald sense of humour, sending people up mercilessly, um, whilst in a sort of quite a sympathetic way. Um, I also got into um, Agatha Christie and uh, really loved the twists and turns of the plot. He desperately wanted to work out who'd done it. And again, you know, those, those things have stood the test of time. Now, are they YA books by today's standards? No, of course they're not. But I got an immense amount out of them. They enriched my teenage years immeasurably. And I don't see why these still can't to this day. Now, um, I, for many years, was a teacher uh, of children up to about the age of 11. And um, I really try to encourage kids to get into reading um, for enjoyment. Not something they were told to do, something they would look forward to do, something they were begged to do. And it, it wasn't difficult, to be honest. So many great books out there. Uh, to cater for all reading abilities and levels of maturity, which, let's let's face it, you know, are varied in all of us. Um, Now, I taught an 11-year-old girl who, I think she was 11, was reading um, Young Chan, excuse me to see if I can say it right, Young Chan's Wild Swans. I I haven't attempted that yet. I think that's going to be quite an effort to do. And you might think, well, that's ridiculous. And I was a little bit shocked at first, but... um, When I spoke to the girl's parents, it was something they were doing together. The mother and the daughter were reading the book at the same time. And they were sharing it and, you know, unpacking things from that together. And what a fantastic thing, you know, something they'll always remember, something they'll have shared. Um, And it was right for them. And why not? You know, I really applauded them for it. It was a fantastic thing to do. Look again at, I know people always refer to Harry Potter, but it is part of this explosion of YA. I think it has a lot to do with it. Um, I'm not saying anything bad about Harry Potter by any means, but essentially a children's book that that made it big with all age groups. And, you know, why not? What's wrong with that? Um, Some people were a bit sniffy about this and they they sort of (laughs) cast aspersions when it was released with different covers, you know, for an older audience. Um, And yet many of the adults who read the especially the first one, essentially a children's book, uh, perhaps would not have read anything else for a long time. I've met quite a few adults, particularly males, who are exactly the kind of guys who say, oh, I've never read a book, or you know, reading's boring, reading's a waste of time, isn't it? You know, and yet there they were. They were loving quite a long book and quite a nice rich text and getting a lot out of it. And so fantastic, you know, well done all round for that. Just bringing it back to Wool a little bit. Um, now, I don't think he wrote it for young adults at all, particularly. I think he was just concentrating on telling a good story. Um, but 
having said that, I don't think that there's anything in wool that would upset the average modern teenager. Um, there's a little bit of strong language in there, but it's not particularly harsh and there's not that much of it. I didn't really notice it that much. Um, and if you look at the things that kids are going to be saying to each other in the in the playgrounds and at school and things they've heard and a lot of the things in the average video game, I think they'll hear much worse language in there. So I don't think that's that's an issue with that at all. Um, so, you know, untwist your knickers, I think, um, if you if you're getting upset about that aspect of it. Um, the plots are quite complex. They if you read all three of those books in the World Trilogy, they cover various periods of time. Um, but, you know, so does an episode of Doctor Who and loads of kids enjoy those and glue to those and understand them. Uh, what's going on when perhaps the parents are going, what, who's, you know, <laughs> how did that happen? What? <laughs> I don't understand how he went back in time and did that. You know, um, it's um, it's nothing for anybody to worry about. Yet they may miss some of the underlying themes, perhaps. Um, I wouldn't guarantee lots of kids will pick up on that, I'm sure. I'm very perceptive people. And um, they, they may not... There's a difference actually between whether somebody's really understood something and whether they're then able to verbalise it afterwards. So depending on their maturity, if you ask a teenager, you know, to explain, to give a little brief speech on what they've understood in the book, that will not be the same as what they've understood deep down, if you follow me. They just may not be able to express it. They haven't got that toolkit yet, perhaps. Um, you know, life is complex and emotions run deep. It's hard to gauge one person's reaction over and above another's to a text, a film, a video game, anything like that. Um, stories give us a way to experience some of that richness and complexity of life and emotions in the safety net of knowing that it's fiction. So that's a fantastic way for young adults of which itself covers a wide range of ages I think range not did I say rage range of ages um, and a well-written story enables them to to live through those vicariously um, now I think that you know going back in time stories have always been used in this way I imagine that the Neolithic people sat around the campfire and, and told stories that scared their kids um, the Victorians certainly did this a lot. I don't know if you've heard any Victorian tales. There are some great Victorian um, storytellers who make a living from going around performing them. And quite frankly, they're absolutely terrifying. You know, they really are quite, they stay with you for, for ages afterwards. And yeah, they, they would, you know, Nanny, who'd perhaps had a bad day with the kids, would maybe get a bit of revenge by telling these horrific stories to the little darlings and then they would, um, just as they've got them, you know, on the edge of hysteria, they'd blow out the candle and say goodnight and leave them in the cold and the dark. <laughs> so um, I think they probably thought it was good for them. I'm not suggesting that we deliberately terrify people, but I think it shows you that you know, our use of story within our daily life adds an extra uh, context you know we look at it in that context and we certainly live in a kinder age than the, the Victorian age thank goodness um, but nevertheless it is good to push the boundaries a little bit with what we are reading and remember that teens are all different readers are all different adults are all different we will respond to things in different ways perhaps depending on a whole variety of, of reasons, you know, a family background and so on, and the kinds of tastes that we have. I would much rather that a teenager was reading a really good book and enjoying a good story um, like Wool than they were watching some of the overhyped, ridiculous nonsense that gets spewed out of Hollywood at regular intervals, which is consumed in huge amounts by young adults and you know we won't get into an argument of whether that is damaging or not again that depends entirely on the context but the point is why are we getting our knickers in a twist about this you know, I've seen people arguing about this online um, 
just because a book is not written for young adults does not mean that it cannot be a good book for young adults. If you want to teach our teenagers anything, let's teach them to be well informed and open minded, teach them to judge things for themselves, to look at something in a critical way and understand when something is just marketing hype and nonsense like the little Hunger Games sticker on, on the paperback and it teach them that you should not be led by the nose by the marketers. They need to make up their minds about things and that means sampling them. You know, you can't decide this writer or this book is not for me unless you have sampled a range of books, unless you've given it a go, you know, read a few pages. So I think um, let you know, let's be a bit more open minded about this. The idea that young adult literature is a thing that it exists is actually nonsense. It's a marketing thing. It's a publishing thing. It's a bookseller wanting a special shelf thing. It doesn't actually exist. It's totally arbitrary. Um, and it leads us to the nonsensical thing of now we've got um, you know, middle grade and uh, new adult. Um, I'm not sure what a new adult is. Perhaps that makes me an old adult, or an established adult. I don't know. Um, when does one become a new adult? And when do you stop being new? And they, oh, I'm slightly jaded adult now. <laughs> That's why I'm a jaded adult. Um, perhaps there's a JA category for us jaded adults. <laughs> That's why we stagger down to the self help section. You know, help me deal with my midlife crisis. Anyway. If I'd had a script, that would have been off it, but I haven't got one, which explains a lot. Um, OK, hopefully I'll be able to put this up on um, YouTube soon. And also it'll be on my website, which is just MikeyCampling.com, uh, where I would love you to leave some comments. Uh, it'd be nice to leave them on there rather than on YouTube, but, you know, I don't mind. I'll, I'll see them either way and I hope to respond if I have time. Um, I'll certainly try. And you also give me a shout on Twitter, I'm at Mikey Campling, or one word, very easy to remember. If I can manage to um, scrape the audio off this thing somehow, I'll put it up with my other podcasts on uh, iTunes. And you can find me on iTunes by looking for Mikey Campling as well. So I'm basically everywhere. If you put Mikey Campling in Google, that's me. <laughs> OK, right. Well, keep writing, keep reading books for whatever age group. Who cares? Read them all young and old, read children's books, read picture books. Why not? There's some fantastic ones. Get any, get as much out of everything as you can, you know, and, and fill your mind with these wonderful experiences because there's certainly plenty of rubbish ones. So let's, you know, let's have some joyous ones as well from whatever the thing they're sold under. And um, if you're a writer, keep writing, keep tapping away, keep scribbling and keep smiling, keep enjoying it. But whatever you do, keep going. Don't stop. I'll sign off now. Thank you very much for listening and for watching. And thank you in advance if you're going to be kind enough to leave a comment. That'd be fantastic. Um, oh, just before I sign off, one last thing to say. When I did write this up in a more concise form on the blog, I mentioned it in a tweet to Hugh Howey and he just did a nice little reply because Hugh's that kind of guy that he will reply to people. And he put, I agree 100%, which is really nice. So thank you very much, Hugh Howie, for that. OK, I really will sign off now. Um, I've been me, you've been you, and uh, everybody else has been somebody else as well. OK, maybe I'll cut that bit off. Right, thank you for listening and watching. And how do I stop it?